Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. How are you this week, Paddy? I'm absolutely fantastic this week, Gary, because it's starting to get sunnier-ish, brighter in the mornings and the evenings. As they say here in Ireland, there's a fine stretch in those evenings, and there's a, a bit of heat in that sun. Um, so yeah, it's getting better. I don't know what it is like down in Cork for you. There was some snow. Was that last week it was snowing? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, we had a wee bit, a very, very wee bit. You know, it was more so schleeting, but yeah. such is life. Well, there's some good snow. Like I live on a mountain, so there was some nice snow up there, went up there, you know, the usual. Um, but yeah, look, anyway, we're still in lockdown. There's still fuck all to do. And we're still just ticking the boxes. We're just, we've actually taken on loads of clients. So if anyone's interested, like now's the time because we're probably going to up our prices soon. Um, but obviously everyone, especially in Ireland, that noticed that the government was like, yeah, actually, you know, we're going to stay locked down until May, April, May. What the fuck? Um, so people are like, because I know a lot of people had inquired and they were kind of like, oh, what are your availability later in the year? You know, I want to go in when, you know, the gyms are open. I'm like, who the fuck knows when that's going to happen? <laughs> At this stage, like you could be waiting until September, you know? So if you are thinking that way, like even if it's not that you want to get on like coaching with us, you're just thinking of like, you know, I'm going to delay my health and fitness goals or whatever until, you know, the situation is perfect. The situation is never going to be perfect. And especially in the environment we're currently in, like it's not going to be perfect for a long while, you know? So you might as well get the jump on it, get after it, whatever that means for you, whether it's home training, whether it's going out for runs, whether it's, you know, just getting your diet tidied up, whatever it is, you might as well start on it now rather than waiting for some arbitrary time in the future, which will probably never come. So with that out of the way, Gary, um, what's the story today? What are we talking about? We're talking about obesity and blood lipids um, and talking about that with reference to cardiovascular disease primarily. So we've been talking about many obesity related complications and you know dietary methods and the environment and all those sorts of things over the last few weeks and months and as a, as as one of the many complications associated with obesity one of the things that that we can see are changes in blood lipids uh there are things like you know cholesterol ldl hdl you may have heard of those things that can potentially increase cardiovascular disease risk we have already mentioned that cardiovascular disease risk is um, increased in those with obesity on average. Again, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to get cardiovascular disease or that everyone has the same level of risk. But on average, as someone begins to gain more and more body fat, cardiovascular disease uh, risk is going to increase. And before touching on blood lipids on their own, I'd like people to get an appreciation for the many different uh, ways in which risk accumulates here. Because when we talk about obesity and blood lipids, if we were to focus solely on the lipid metrics, so for example, someone's how much HDL is in their blood, how much LDL is in their blood, those types of things, it's not going to tell you the full story about the person's cardiovascular risk. Because we also have to consider, um, does this person also have high blood pressure? And if someone is obese, they're going to have a higher likelihood of high blood pressure already. And do they have other complications such as insulin resistance and or hyperglycemia or high or dysregulated blood, blood sugar or blood glucose um, or, you know, full on type two diabetes. Again, those complications um, increase risk of cardiovascular disease once again. And then there are other things that obviously people will be familiar with, such as um, inactivity, if that is something that someone is um, presenting with with obesity, again, not everyone is inactive, but they might also be inactive um, as part of their, their obesity presentation. And then along with that, obviously, other risk factors such as uh, smoking, alcohol use, uh, obstructive sleep apnea that might be the result of obesity or part of that presentation. So all of these things come together along with the blood lipids to increase cardiovascular disease risk. And the reason that we would be concerned about something like blood lipids is basically because of the process of atherosclerosis. And we've recorded a couple of podcasts on this topic in the past. So I'd 
refer you back to those for a detailed explanation. We have one titled Introduction to Atherosclerosis and another with Alan Flanagan where we discussed all of the dietary um, elements related to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. But fundamentally, what we're talking about with atherosclerosis is the accumulation of plaques within arterial walls. So within your blood vessels, you get the, the accumulation of these plaques. And what can happen over time is that as the, the plaques accumulate and the arterial walls stiffen, we can eventually get one uh, stenosis. So you can get the narrowing of a blood vessel. So there's not as much room for flow to a given organ, such as your heart, but we can also get um, the rupture of those plaques. And if that plaque ruptures, it can basically fly down the artery and clog up um, somewhere down the line, such as a coronary artery, for example. Um, coronary arteries are the arteries that supply your heart. And when we get enough plaque that's built up within those coronary arteries, that's what leads to basically a heart attack. Okay. So these are the reasons that we would be concerned is the, that the blood lipids are related to that process of atherosclerosis. So that brings us to the point at which we need to, you know, realize wh where obesity comes in here. And obesity comes into the discussion of blood lipids for two reasons, I would say, and we can dichotomize it like that. One, a diet pattern that is more likely like genetic in the first place is Oh, my, uh, my microphone changed. Can you hear me okay? No, you're all good. Yep. Um, a diet pattern that is likely to be obesogenic, for example, one in which you're consuming a lot of calorie-dense processed foods, really tasty foods. Um, so that, that, that process of eating that type of diet increases the chances that you'll have dyslipidemia or um, unfavorable blood lipids regardless of the end weight, okay? So someone could be at a quote unquote normal weight within a normal weight range, not have excess body fat, and they could have deranged blood lipids um, without being obese, okay? And that could be simply the result of the diet that they've consumed, high saturated fat, low unsaturated fat, you know, lots of sugar in the diet, lots of calories overall. All these things can increase the likelihood of you having deranged blood lipids. So if someone is- on that not, as well. Like both of us had elevated LDL after Christmas, you know, and like yeah. we would both be like consider ourselves to first of all manage that really well, you know, like eat healthily, etc. But like, well, I would also consider us both to be at normal weight. If anything, you're a little bit underweight, um, but <laughs> um, you know, like we're, we're both managing this stuff. We're both involved in you know, the health and fitness industry, so like we like to pay attention to this stuff. And I'd like to think that, you know, we know more than the average person about how to manage this stuff well. But even in both of us after, you know, I wouldn't even say an overly indulgent Christmas for on either of our behalfs, you know, it was still elevated, which, you know, who really cares about the transient stuff? You know, if it is literally just very transient. Um, but if it is something that's over a couple of months, weeks, whatever, like it might be more important to pay attention to. But I just bring that up because a lot of people, you know, even though we're talking about this in the context of obesity, like you could be like non-obese, not even in like whatever, overweight territory, whatever. You could have shredded six. I've actually seen people with, you know, fucking razor sharp abs, you know, and like you're thinking they're one paper cut away from dying. They're like so vascular and their lipids are, you know, terrible. So like that is something to pay attention to. Um, even if you're not obese, you know, it's like this, this can still, this is still something you should understand. Yeah, hundred percent. And that is a, a good point because like when I last, when I had my, my bloods checked a few weeks back, um, coming out of the Christmas period also, um, didn't have much of an appetite at the time. So I was basically just eating kind of a relatively low quality diet. Like I was kind of making up a lot of my calories with things like chocolate and tiffin and stuff that was left over from Christmas. And I didn't really have much of an appetite for fruits and vegetables and the fibrous foods that I normally would. So for that couple of weeks leading up to, um, that period of time when I had my blood lipids checked, like I was lean, you know, my triglycerides were really low. My blood glucose was low. My HDL was high. So basically everything was in a really good place and I looked great. Um, but when you actually look at the LDL, it was slightly increased again, not above like the actual level at which it would be 
classified as high. But for us who like to optimize things, we'd be like, oh, maybe a little higher than I'd like it. Um, so it does just tell you that those things can affect you regardless of how much you're, you're training or how lean you are. So when it comes to obesity, then obviously someone, uh, someone didn't just become or get to the point where they're classified as obese and accumulate excess body fat without consuming the excess energy in the process. So that has to happen. And very often that happens um, in the presence of an overall poor diet pattern because of the modern food environment and the way in which we, we view the, the standard kind of Western diet. So most people don't have fantastic high fiber, low saturated fat diets. So that's what you're going to see a lot of the time. So that could lead to the person having deranged blood lipids as it is. And when I say deranged blood lipids, some of the things you might be considering are elevated LDL. Again, these are oversimplifications, but they're just, they're enough for today. Elevated LDL, lower HDL and elevated triglycerides as well. So they're kind of the three primary things you'd be looking at. So those things can start to become deranged uh, just because of one's diet, but particularly as you move into that uh, place where you are more obese, what starts to happen is, as we've discussed in previous podcasts, you develop insulin resistance. And this is basically a, p a point at which you start to have other metabolic complications and other metabolic dysfunction. And some of the things that can happen as a result of that excess body fat is basically you get more release of or more breakdown of your your fat from your fat cells or more lipolysis which sounds like it would be a good thing you know it's like oh we've got all this fat that's coming into the blood we're going to burn it off and lose it but that's not really what happens so what what can happen in that insulin resistant or an obese state is you get all of this uh, fat that is around that is in the blood so you get an increase in, in fatty acids in the blood they're basically going through the liver and once the the liver is it can it's storing its fat you don't want to store too much fat in your liver but what it starts to do is actually export um, those excess fatty acids as VLDL particles so very low density lipoprotein particles and they're then exported out into your blood and basically this increase in flux of fatty acids and triglycerides and cholesterol from your from your blood to your liver into your blood um, what ends up happening is you start to get this this transfer um, of of these different lipid molecules um, between the different molecules to the point where you end up with something that's referred to as atherogenic dyslipidemia. And this is basically a state where you've got uh, the elevated LDL, you've got your low HDL, and you've got higher triglycerides. And the resulting the resultant state is one in which you you have the, probably the most um, cardiovascular risk because, because of that, that specific phenotype and that's associated with insulin resistance. And other things that happen in that case is you actually get remodeling of those particles as well. Um, so I've really oversimplified the fatty acid flux stuff, but you also get you know triglyceride um, rich remnants within the blood. So there's other particle types um, that and, and and anytime you look at these these kind of particles and you're thinking about LDL and HDL, it it is more complicated than that because the LDL molecules themselves they it can also vary in their size and their density, and it's thought that but not a hundred percent clear uh, that the smaller more dense LDL particles seen in insulin resistant are potentially more atherogenic or more likely to lead to that atherosclerotic process. So overall, if we were to summarize it fundamentally in obesity with insulin resistance, we end up in a position where the three primary metrics that someone might be interested in are all moving in the wrong direction quantitatively, but also qualitatively, there are differences in the actual particle types um, that are within the blood itself that then also increase the overall cardiovascular disease risk. So there are some of the primary things we would be looking at um, when it comes to, to obesity, insulin resistance, um, and, and blood lipids. Yeah, like just to kind of clarify a few things, or like at least, you know, hopefully clarify for the listeners. Um, one question that, you know, I used to think as well, and it's not, it's not as well researched as you would, think or like and this is one of the reasons why you have this uh you know people talk about like oh metabolically healthy obesity right and this is something that i go back and forth on and i read the literature myself um, and that is like can you be obese right 
but like you were saying there, there's kind of two pathology or two, I'm going to say pathologies, that's wrong. Two uh, things working in tandem, right? One is like, we'll call it the standard American diet. That's sad diet pattern, you know, high saturated fat, low fiber intake, you know, just crap processed foods, etc. cetera, right? Um, and then also the obesity. So both of those things. Now, what I always look at this and I, I go back and forth in my own head about this and um, if you were to be an obese individual, an, an obese individual, I can't even speak today, right? If you were to be an obese individual and you had consumed a overall healthful diet to get to that obese place, you know, you're eating lots of fiber, you're eating lots of like lean cuts of meat and whatever, just, I don't know, you have, I, don't know, I was going to say you have a, like a leptin dysregulation, but you know, let's assume you've no actual diseases that are causing the obesity. You just like food, <laughs> right? So you're just overeating and you get to that obese st- uh, stage, right? But your diet pattern itself is relatively healthy. You know, is that going to protect you from the, the negatives of obesity, you know? And secondary to that question, is it like, if you are already obese and you just switch to a healthful diet pattern, like is that going to ameliorate all the the issues that have been caused by the unhealthful diet pattern that you got to that obese place in, you know, like tease that out for me. Cause I, I go back and forth in my own mind about this. And again, it is one of those things when I read this, this, the stuff about like, you know, mel- metabolically healthy obesity, I'm like, yeah, it's not just the obesity that we need to look at. We need to look at it from the two directions, like how the individual got obese and then also, inflammation from the obesity say for example yeah and so so firstly um the the first part of the question you know as it relates to obesity we have to kind of jump back to what we discussed a couple of podcasts ago related to metabolically healthy obesity so um if someone is is at the point where they're classified as obese, but they've got more fat that's distributed uh, peripherally, for example, in their limbs, in their lower limbs, but not so much in their abdomen, not so much around their organs viscerally. It's more likely that someone could could be in an obese position and eat a healthy diet pattern and not be suffering um, with any complications related to blood lipids because they're less likely to be insulin resistant. But if someone is at the point where they're they're obese and they also um, have insulin resistance um, in in the sense that they've they've they're less responsive to the insulin that's within their blood and potentially as a result have started to um, develop uh, high high blood sugar or they might just have hyperinsulinemia so higher levels of insulin that are now compensating. If you're in that position already and you're on that pathway of insulin resistance, then even if you are consuming a healthful diet pattern. Um, just by virtue of being in a position where you are obese and you've gone beyond that personal fat threshold, um, that is still likely to be elevating uh, risk and, and modifying uh, blood lipids, even in that case where, where, where you are even in the position where you're obese and have a healthy diet pattern. So I, it's not the, the diet itself that can totally erase um, the risk that's associated with obesity. Not in every case anyway. It's certainly a really good start. So it would be reducing the person's risk for sure. So someone might have, let's say, 50% of of their their risk that's associated with the fact that it's just the excess body fat and the complications of that. And the other 50% might be related to the diet pattern. So you could certainly improve that. Like if you're someone that um, has has poor blood lipids and you you are obese, but you're thinking, you know what, I don't particularly want to um, pursue weight loss right now, you could absolutely start consuming more fiber, more fruits and vegetables, um, reducing your saturated fat intake. And you could definitely see positive changes in your blood lipids without losing a pound. That can absolutely be the case. Um, so that is a really important point uh, to, to mention. But the second part of the question is also interesting um, because this is actually somewhat relevant to the way in which someone might modify their diet and also um, the potential need for medications for some people. So you asked, you know, if someone has, you know, gone through the process of um, they've been obese and they've lost weight uh, successfully, can, can they, or will they be removing all of the risk that was accumulated during the process of becoming obese um, and, and being in, in, in that position of obesity? And the answer would be, Probably not. Like you're probably not going to erase all of that risk because as you develop atherosclerosis, what happens is 
you're accumulating that plaque over years and decades. And to basically, like you can stall that process and you can reverse that process. But the thing is to reverse that process, you need to get your blood lipids into a really, really brilliant place. Okay. So you need to get your LDL down nice and low. And it's often a position that is quite difficult to attain through diet. It might be, you might need to be very strict, like close to like a whole food plant-based diet, for example. Like it doesn't mean it has to be totally exclusive of animal products, but you definitely want to be keeping a a real eye on what you're eating to be able to get it to the level where you're actually going to see that regression of plaque that's already there. Um, and, and very often, to be honest, it's, it's medication that's needed to actually reduce um, or reverse that process of atherosclerosis. So that's an area of research that is a little bit unclear in terms of what effect um, diet can have and what, what, how significant the effect is going to be to actually reversing atherosclerosis. Um, so while, while there may be some reversal, I think for, for a lot of people at least, to get below that threshold, um, typically 70 70 milligrams per deciliter is that sort of cutoff that that's that's used to get below that for a lot of people they're going to need medication um but that doesn't mean that you just need medication if you've been obese in the past because you mightn't have significant atherosclerosis this is primarily a goal of secondary prevention which would be if someone has already had a cardiovascular event so if someone's had a heart attack for example um for for that specific case medication is, is, is always recommended anyway. So medication and more rigorous changes in your diet would be required to get the LDL low enough where you actually start to reverse that process. But um, reversal of, of, of atherosclerosis and the processes required to get there, that's not something you just recommend across the board. You know, um, we, We're not always living with the goal of having the lowest LDL possible. Like, yeah, it's a good thing, but you don't need to be 100% focusing on that all the time, you know? Yeah, and this is like it's important to understand overall that this stuff is rather complex for something that is you would think simple enough, right? Um, and obviously, there's a lot of you know, first of all, like misinformation out there in and of itself, and also like poor science. It's not just like you know people on the web that are like, oh, this is the the answer or whatever. It's not just them putting out bad information. Like oftentimes, like the studies are just poor or they don't have enough like, you know, statistical power or like there's some issue with them. And then people use those studies to run away with whatever conclusion they, they want to draw from it, you know? So like this stuff is complex, but I just want to bring it back to like the overall like change in blood lipids because of obesity and how that would change going up versus going down. Right. And I just want to really focus on like, the, the three big ones here, we'll say, in terms of LDL, triglycerides, and HDL, right? So, like, if we are eating a diet, like, I, again, I'm going back to that one where it's like if we're eating a, an overall healthful diet, but body fat is accumulating. Because let's just take out of the equation the, the socioeconomics. Let's take out of the equation, like, the stress. Let's take out of the equation, you know, poor diet pattern, all that other stuff, right? And we'll look at it the way most people look at it in terms of it's just a, a purely... I know, physiological event, a biochemical event, if you will, right? So diet pattern is, you know, A1. They're eating a Mediterranean diet, you know, but they're just eating a lot of the white supremacist Mediterranean diet, right? (laughs) And just that's in reference to some nutritionist or I don't know, maybe dietitian. They said that the Mediterranean diet is a white supremacist diet and it excludes people of color, even though, of course, the Mediterranean literally borders Europe and Africa. But anyway, um, that's beside the point. Um, Also, you know, the Middle East also comes onto it. But anyway, look, that's beside the point. Um, So they're eating the Mediterranean diet and they're just eating a lot of extra calories. How would you expect or think their LDL would change? How would you think their triglycerides? We should start with triglycerides because that's probably the easiest one to understand how that would change, right? But then in terms of like, LDL and HDL, right? How would that change on the way up? And then how would that change on the way down? Like, is that, is it as simple as we're going to see on the way up, LDL go up and triglycerides go up and HDL go down. And on the way down, we're going to see LDL go down, 
triglycerides go down and HDL go up. Is it as simple as that? You know, I'm trying to get rid of all the other factors and just focus on the, the changing in weight. Is that like, is the weight loss per se just going to fix things, right? And I know we, we just touched on that, but I just want to really solidify that and clarify that in terms of like, is it just purely the weight? Yeah, that's a good question. And there's, the, firstly, as you're, as you're on the way up and you're, and you're gaining weight, like if you're, if you're at a point where you're, you know, quite lean and you're gaining a bit of body fat, like when you're metabolically healthy and you haven't passed the so-called personal fat threshold, you wouldn't expect these metrics to be affected very significantly. Like you might have very subtle changes, but you wouldn't expect there to be that much of an effect that would be considered clinically meaningful. If you're someone who's like going to the gym and you're like, I want to gain a couple of kilos because I'm trying to gain some muscle. Um, or, you know, you're just gaining, you're gaining a few pounds or whatever through a totally healthful diet. I wouldn't expect there to be many significant um, changes, but even with a perfect diet, you know, you're thinking of, you're doing all of the things that you've said, as you continue to overfeed calories, you will eventually start to reach a point where you do start to surpass that personal fat threshold um, and metabolic complications start to become more pronounced at which point those changes in blood lipids are likely to become more pronounced. And then, as you say, on the other way, on the way down again, as you pursue weight loss to get to that point within a, a more metabolically healthy range, you would expect to see um, those improvements uh, that, that are the result of the weight loss and, and the subsequent metabolic changes that are part of um, weight loss. So even with the same uh, diet quality and perfect diet quality uh, and those changes in energy, as we begin to move from different body composition uh, thresholds, you absolutely will start to see some changes um, in your blood lipids as a result. But again, it is one of those things where that they can be different places for different people. You could be someone who like you just happen to, as soon as you gain weight, you start to accumulate visceral body fat. You start to accumulate all of your body fat around your abdomen. Um, and, and that might just, you know, lead to those complications accumulating much sooner than someone who is uh, classified ob as ob being obese, but is actually quite metabolically healthy when you actually look at um, the, the metrics that we typically consider to be important. Um, but even when we, when we start to think about those things, it is still important to consider the overall um, risk in general, because we, we do always have to keep that in mind that we're not just, you know, looking for blood lipid targets for their own sake. We're thinking about overall cardiovascular risk. So it might be the case that, you know, your blood lipids look to still be in a good place, but your blood pressure is increased by 10 millimeters of mercury, you know, those things are important as well. Um, so when you are, you know, going to your doctor, they're the types of things you're thinking about. You know, what's my overall risk like? You know, if my, if my uh, blood lipids are fine, but my blood pressure is way out of whack, that's something that's important, okay? So remember, all of those things go together. And that's why your doctor, if you go to them, they're, they want to look at multiple different variables, even if you are someone who's exercising and eating well, because, you know, it, it's, it's not always enough. So, so yeah, I think that, that hopefully clears up the question. Yeah, hundred percent. And then I kind of have a, a secondary question to this. And I, this is something that people, I think kind of miss the boat with when we're discussing this stuff. And like, I know people from this discussion you just had there will also start thinking this as well. If it's a case that once we get past this, uh, you know, body fat threshold, right? This, you know, we'll call it a insulin sensitivity threshold, right? Does it become an issue there It's it, where it's basically you know, oh, it's just insulin sensitivity that we have to worry about, right? So if I was to change my diet to like a ketogenic diet or something, it wouldn't matter. Even if my blood lipids, et cetera, you know, were completely in the toilet from what the, you know, the medical community think is okay, I'm actually managing insulin sensitivity or so I think, you know, maybe I'm going on a ketogenic diet, a high fat ketogenic diet, right? And I'm doing that to what seems to be the, the root issue here is insulin sensitivity or insulin in general. It's just not working the way we want it to. It's not putting the, the energy in, in the place that we want it to. Is that just, is that kind of missing the forest for the trees? Is that, is, is that logical to think that way? It's just like you said that basically blood lipids are going to be okay. But once we're insulin sensitivity or insulin sensitive, you know, that's basically where we're at. Right. But then as soon as we get past that threshold by accumulating body fat, they start going out of whack. Right. 
So why don't we just address the insulin sensitivity? And a lot of people will use something like a ketogenic diet to do that, which, you know, in my perspective, I'm like, that's not actually a great approach. But anyway, um, is that is that smart? Yeah. So, so what you're referring to here is, is kind of zooming in on like what is actually more important? Because the thing is, when, when you start to adopt a, a ketogenic diet, most of the time, what will happen when people are on that super high fat diet is they will actually start to see um, worsening blood lipids as a primarily uh, increases in LDL. So they'll start to see increases in their LDL cholesterol, which would typically be associated with increases in cardiovascular risk. Um, that can be simultaneously true as, um, or that can be true while simultaneously also being the case that they've uh, lost weight successfully, improved their markers of insulin resistance, better regulated blood glucose, and you know reduce their risk from that side of things. So this is the really important thing to get is that um, it, it, you can't just zoom in on one of these metrics and assume that that's going to tell the whole story because the best case scenario for someone who is um, who has um, blood lipids that are out of whack at the moment, let's say, is for them to improve their diet in such a way that. Mm -hmm. They lose weight successfully. They're more insulin sensitive. Uh, they're eating enough fiber and low saturated fat so that now um, their LDL is lower. The HDL is in a good place. It's higher. Their triglycerides are nice and low. Like that's, that's gold standard. That's, what, that's ideal. But someone could, sim someone could get some of those benefits. They could have lower triglycerides. Their HDL might have increased, but now their LDL is way up because of the changes in their diet associated with the ketogenic diet. So while they may have improved some things, there's still that red flag of the, the massive increase in LDL that they've seen that's potentially then increasing their cardiovascular risk. So you do have to keep all of those things in mind. And while, and, and I, I, I re I, I can't emphasize that point enough because what happens sometimes is people have great success on a ketogenic diet because it helped them lose weight. And that's fantastic. But as a result, they decide that, well, if it's good for most of the things that I consider to be helpful, it has to be good for everything. So that means if my LDL has gone up, well, that's not a bad thing now because look, I've gotten healthier. And the ideal situation there would be to actually say, oh, well, maybe I could just actually stay on a low carb, high fat diet, but maybe I'll have a bit more salmon and I'll have some more nuts and I'll have some less butter because that's actually going to give me the best of both worlds. Then why don't I do that? So, so yeah, look, and, and even when it comes to the, keto, the ketogenic diet, a low carb, high fat diet, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting rid of insulin resistance just because you have no carbohydrates. Like that's a really important point as well, because people do forget that they think that um, you know, blood glucose um, or glucose and, and glucose input are, are the same thing as um, insulin resistance. And they're not necessarily the same thing. So someone could still be insulin resistant um, or, or not so sensitive or rather resistant to, to glucose feeding, you could say, if they were to consume a high carbohydrate meal. So if you're on a ketogenic diet um, and yeah, your blood glucose is nice and low, you're not consuming um, any, any sugar in your diet, you're not consuming any carbohydrates in your diet, you could then take a test meal of carbohydrates, um, consume that 50 grams of carbohydrates and have a massive increase in your blood glucose um, because you still haven't really addressed uh, the insulin resistance if you're at the, the same weight, for example. So, so yeah, it's certainly more complex than, than that kind of internet meme idea of that like you just reduce your carbs and that fixes everything it's um not so simple yeah and this is also a thing where it's like you don't know what you're not looking at you know because like for example you might be looking at just your blood lipids and go oh yeah okay let's not let's just forget about ldl and you know i'm on this ketogenic diet or this you know low carb diet overall but then you look at other blood metrics, you know, like, uh, the sex hormones, you know, it's like, okay, well, okay. Your testosterone has changed now a lot or your SHBG. That's a, that's a classic one. Cause that's actually influenced a lot by insulin. Not that the other sex hormones aren't, they definitely are. But like all of a sudden, like you see all of these low carbers, their SHBG is just in the fucking toilet, you know? And I, I mean that it's extremely high. Right. Um, so it's like, this is, and that's sex hormone binding globulin for anyone who's listening. Um, like, every single time, which is not a good thing, right? Like you, you don't want to have that high, but then they'll start saying like, oh, it is a good thing because, you know, it keeps testosterone in the body for longer. And again, they just start changing the goalposts like they did with LDL. Like if your diet paradigm and a whole training, par whatever paradigm 
requires you to shift multiple goalposts for it to be acceptable, like you're probably in on the wrong track. You know, that's not to say that it's not working for one or two other things. I could potentially be very true. However, we have to look at the broader picture and like every single time I've seen someone's blood work with a low carb approach and even like, you know, low carb advocates online, every time they show their blood work, they might be like, Oh yeah, look, my testosterone is in range. And like, I would argue it's low because I'm a high T advocate, <laughs> but uh, they'll be like, Oh yeah, look, it's 400 or something nanograms per deciliter. Right. Um, and then they'll be like, look, it's great. Testosterone is in a good place. They're like, Oh, I'd like it to be higher, etc." but I'm lean or whatever. But then you look at like their sex hormone binding globulin and it's like fucking, I don't know, 80 or something. It's like, this is, you're like fucking 40 above the reference range. Like we're in a bad place here. You know, so it's like, you can't just look at one metric uh, when you're looking at like blood chemistry, like you have to look at the multiple things that are going on. And this is why it's so important to actually work with like a medical professional rather than just looking at, you know, data yourself, right? That can definitely be a great place to start in terms of like, you know, like we always use uh, let's get check- checked with our clients if they're ever looking for blood work. We also have a code for that, triage 20. Um, <laughs> but like even in that context, it's like, you know, we're looking at something very specific, you know, we're not going to be like, let's interpret a, a whole big blood panel here. I'm like, that's a doctor's job, right? Like we can use that to, you know, get a better idea of how things are changing. And for example, you might do a, a cholesterol or a fatty, or a, not a fatty acid, like a, a blood fat panel right and be like well like blood lipids where are they at right and then see where they're at and you go okay your ldl is here your hdl is here triglycerides are here cool now we're going to do our 16 week intervention or however long um of training diet etc just see what happens right and then you see at the end of it you're like okay so we didn't even focus on this but we just focused on healthful diet patterns you know maybe a little bit of weight loss came with that maybe a little bit of increased insulin sensitivity came because you know we changed up our training and we're getting better results from that it's like okay cool we actually saw the results so oftentimes you're just looking for you know what is actually happening under the hood and that's not required for everyone but a lot of people especially with blood work and i know we're, we're kind of talking about it a lot because we are talking about blood lipids like oftentimes people get carried away with this stuff and think it's to be all and end all and forget that first of all there's you know genetic differences like you might just be an individual that just has i don't know high ldl always you know and, and then also it's like you're not trained to interpret this stuff you know it's like you're this is not your job you know even if you're a personal trainer listening to this strength coach nutritionist whatever like it's not your job that's a, a a medical professional's job and oftentimes like most medical professionals aren't even trained enough to fully interpret it what they're going to do is go i know a specialist i'm going to refer you to the specialist because you know i can look at blood uh, i don't know your blood lipids and say like oh yeah your cholesterol seems to be a little bit out of whack but i know you're doing all these good interventions you're eating a healthful diet blah 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 so we're going to need to dig deeper into this and i'm going to refer you to x person to dig deeper into this because again they will understand it's not their their wheelhouse like a hundred percent and gary you'll probably have some words to say on this like you were taught how to look at a blood panel or you're at least taught what the, the different measures mean that doesn't mean that you become an expert on it just because you were taught once you know yeah a hundred percent and like i mean if you go to your your gp like you're typically gonna um the standard readout you'll, you'll get is just something like uh triglycerides ldl hdl total cholesterol but that's not like that's not even a quarter of the things that someone could potentially be interested in if you're like an advanced lipidologist. So there's a real spectrum here where like when you're looking at a blood lipid panel um, at the, for, for a GP, you know, there might be, you know, screening for the kind of baseline level, getting a rough idea of what's going on. Um, a cardiologist then is probably is going to have a next level um analysis or, or level of knowledge related to blood lipids. And then you've got people who are certified specifically in lipidology who are going to have um, even more advanced knowledge um, of lipids. So there's so many different things that can potentially be measured and modify risk. But for the vast majority of people, it's primarily just going to be a case of like trying to see the big picture things like, all right, you know, it says that LDL is elevated. Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily tell you all of the details. Like it doesn't tell you um, the particle size. It doesn't tell you the, the particle number. All these different um, variables are also 
um, going go into things, you know, and, and more strict measures of of ApoB, um, the actual apolipoproteins themselves, um, and there and there's many many other different things that people can potentially measure, like the the um, remnant particles that we mentioned previously, those triglyceride rich remnants, like they're not something that you're really going to be um, hearing about from from your GP the vast majority of the time. So, so yeah, I'll look on that as well. Like we like just like with weight, like ideally you want to see a trend, like one reading of like oh your LDL like we said our LDL was elevated like I think mine was like 3.2 and yours was like 3.5 or something <laughs> you know it's like 3.3 <laughs> 3. 3. I was still lower just saying um but like you know like it's not like we were in a terrible place but we know overall our blood lipids are in a good place for the rest of the year so like you don't want to get freaked out by a singular measure of this stuff and a good like you know GP good cardiologist etc wouldn't look at like oh you had one you know measure here and it was elevated that means that we're in an extreme risk category whatever no they would look at getting more blood work done seeing what the the story is maybe again i don't know you're a doctor or you're in trainee doctor so you would know more about like what they would potentially intervene with but they're going to look for more data you know Um, and that's the way you have to look at this stuff like I know we're kind of hypothesizing and theorizing and looking at the the research and stuff while we're talking about like blood lipids and obesity here but there's a lot more that goes into this. Uh, there's a lot more under the hood. Um, and well, again, like we're looking at this mainly from a, an exercise and nutrition perspective, like it might be a case that you actually have to like pharmacologically intervene because again, as I said earlier on, like you could just have a genetic polymorphism that I don't know, means that your LDL is always elevated or, you know, you have a certain type of LDL. That's just a negative one, <laughs> you know? And um, like there's, there's lots of different things that could be going on and, you're not just going to be able to figure this out yourself unless you're willing to, you know, put a lot of time into uh, reading up on this. However, like the one thing I always look with a lot of this stuff, or I should say that's, I don't know how I said that, but that was terrible. But <laughs> the, the thing that I always look at when I'm looking at a lot of this stuff is like, can we find a, a proxy measure, right? That's easy for anyone to really look at, right? And the one I look at with blood lipids is LDL and HDL, right? And I'd say that's one, it's, it's two, right? Because, Again, if you have a trend line of where those two are and you know that, oh, I was eating a little bit of a calorie deficit here or, you know, I was doing this with my diet, et cetera, like you can still have a pretty good understanding of your overall risk. And I mean this throughout whether you're extremely lean or you're overweight or obese or whatever. Like if you have an idea of where those two numbers are, like you probably have a little bit of a snapshot into your overall metabolic health, right? Well, I say you're cardiovascular disease risk, I should say, you know, like it gives you a little bit of a snapshot. It's definitely not the whole picture. However, like if we're looking at a, you know, relatively low cost, low stress, like proxy measure, just like it would be like, you know, stepping on the scales, like blood lipids, HDL and LDL. Like if you keep an eye on those throughout the years and maybe you notice that your LDL is creeping up, that's something that you should maybe start thinking about trying to reverse or again, conversely, if you start noticing your HDL is going down and um, that's something that you should try to, you know, reverse. And, um, but I wouldn't get caught up on like a singular measure of this stuff. However, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that these are, you know, irrelevant. Like you should still occasionally get them measured, even if it's like, you know, I don't know, an annual checkup with your doctor and you're in a, say you're male over 30 like i would still be like yeah like you're probably in a significant no, i should say significant you're probably in a higher risk category especially if you're overweight especially if you you know i don't know know you don't have a good diet etc right like if there's other things that you're like this is something i should pay attention to it's a fairly low cost intervention i shouldn't say intervention i should say measure of how we're doing and that can give you more information to potentially change your diet exercise lifestyle habits Yes, sir. Check. Phenomenal. Anyway, is there anything else you'd like to, to cover? Um, I don't think there's much else. Like, I think we covered a lot in that. I know this is a kind of an episode where it was a little bit all over the place because we're talking about blood lipids and like this falls into a category that, you know, we've kind of already discussed a lot of the stuff that goes on with this in terms of like cardiovascular disease risk, et cetera. Um, but I just wanted to have this covered so that you guys were thinking about it a little bit more and also hopefully realize that it's not just a case of weight being the issue, right? It's the overall diet pattern that got us there. Those are the kind of two big things that are, you know, modifying your risk, you know, and this is why, again, you could be metabolically healthy and obese and have, you know, phenomenal 
blood lipids if you are engaging in healthful diet patterns diet lifestyle training patterns you know so as gary said earlier on like that's definitely something that we would advocate for in terms of you know you're looking to improve your health like yeah i don't care if your weight doesn't change at all right you could be 400 pounds and if you're in a good reference range you know level for your all your blood markers and you're like i want to actually just improve my health and um, you could or sorry i should say you're not in a good reference range level for all these blood markers and you're like i want to improve my health and um, you can still just change your diet patterns without ever focusing on actual weight loss and still see significant results however there is still that you know, level of insulin resistance that goes along with having an accumulated uh, a certain amount of body fat for you at an individual level. And at some stage, it's probably going to be pertinent for your overall health to at least get below that marker. It doesn't mean that you have to have like, you know, six pack washboard abs or anything, but it does mean that there's a level for you that you're going to have better health, better blood markers, etc. below that, you know? Yes, sir. Check. So if you're someone, you know, with uh, obesity and you're thinking, you know, you want to um, lose weight, then that is something that absolutely can reduce your risk. But if you're not in that position and you're like, you know what, I'm actually satisfied with where I am. I've tried weight loss. It didn't really work for me. You can still absolutely make positive improvements with your diet. So that's something that's always really important to, to remember, you know? So if you're, you know, if you want to improve your diet, obviously you can eat more fruits and vegetables. Most people are aware that that's generally a good thing, but also just trying to eat more fiber is, is a big area of, of improvement for a lot of people. So swapping your carbohydrate sources over to those that are generally higher in fiber, um, more whole grains, beans, legumes, uh, basically more single ingredient carbohydrate sources is a pretty sound approach, um, provided that single ingredient isn't just sugar, you know? Um, so that's a, generally a good idea. Um, and then reducing uh, the, the amount of saturated fat in the diet and increasing the amount of unsaturated fat in the diet is, is a, a good uh, approach generally. So if you're normally cooking with butter, maybe swap that out for um, some sort of uh, other cooking oil uh, that's unsaturated, such as, you know, you could use olive oil, for example, um, or just just use the no oil at all, which is a good idea to reduce your calories, you know, unless you're, you're really particular about the taste. Um, and obviously then reducing uh, other processed foods in the diet that are contributing overall calories is a good idea. Um, but again, it mightn't be weight loss that you're looking for, but you can still improve diet quality. So for more details on those specifics, I'd recommend going back to the episode with Alan Flanagan, where we discussed this um, and also uh, the episode on the introduction to atherosclerosis. We do have a full cardiovascular series that we did um, in 2020. So do check that out too. Um, further, furthermore, if you'd like guidance on the path to improving your diet quality, uh, you can work with us on a nutrition only basis. You know, you get your nutrition in order that way, or you might want to work on training and nutrition. We do have coaching spaces available for nutrition only and training and nutrition. So you can sign up, um, or inquire at the description in the, at the link in the description box below, or reach out to us on info at triagemethod.com. We'd also recommend you subscribe to our newsletter, the triage method newsletter, um, and follow us on our social media. You can follow me at skinny Gaz, Patty at the real Patty Farrell and Brian O'Hangasa at Brian O'Hangasa. Again, you'll find those, um, linked below, hopefully. Um, so no, you won't. <laughs> so anyway, you, you'll find all those things on our social media. Check us all out, all that good stuff. Um, we do have a member site as well, the Coach's Corner. If you are a coach, you can subscribe, um, get involved with your education. Um, and other than that, join our free Facebook group, tri the Triage Method Community. Um, and I don't think there's anything else to do, really. No, nothing. You've covered it all. All of it exceptional stuff, Gary. Um, anyway, yeah, I have nothing else to say. Um, we have a few exciting episodes coming up in the next while, so... That'll be exciting, I suppose. <laughs> um, we also are really building out our, our coaching platform overall. Um, and we're probably going to increase our prices relatively soon. And I know we said that before, um, but we did increase our prices. <laughs> um, and we're probably going to do it again. So if you are thinking about it, you know, before we have built out the stuff that we want to build out and you're like, oh, I want to jump in, you know, before the price goes up, now is the time. Again, don't be waiting for, oh, I'm going to wait two months, you know, a month, whatever, until like gyms open up, whatever. Like, it's just not, I just wouldn't wait for that. That wouldn't be me, especially if you're in Britain. As I said, like, they're probably going to be locked down until September. So like, I know we have a lot of uh, British people that 
listen to this podcast. We actually have a lot of Australians as well. Shout out to the Aussies. Um, I don't know if they're Irish abroad, but maybe not in the current situation, COVID, et cetera. Um, but maybe it is. I don't know, but shout out to the Aussies either way. Um, but yeah, if you're in lockdowns and you're kind of like, I don't know, like I think I might just wait. Don't wait because you'll come back to us in six months time when the place finally opens and be like, right, the price is too much for me now, you know? So like, don't wait. Anyway, other than that, um, you yeah, have nothing else to say, Gary. Um, do you? No, nope. goodbye. Phenomenal. See you later.